Finally, it looks like Paddy is going to be dragged kicking and screaming to court to face a jury and answer questions about whether or not its training standards are safe and how they hold their instructors accountable. Rather than linger on the tragic details of the Linear Mills case, which has hung over me like a black cloud since her highly preventable death in that frigid Montana lake in 2020, I wanted to share with you my hopes for the legacy of Linear Mills and the changes I hope it brings to our sport. It's Mouthpiece Monday time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Divers Ready. My name's James. It's great to see you as always. Normally I start my videos with it's great to see all your smiling faces, but in this case, there's not a great deal to smile about. So I apologize in advance. For the morbid nature of this video, it really isn't my natural style, but it needs to be addressed. If you aren't familiar with the case that I referenced in my introduction, congratulations, keep living your happy life. I'm either through morbid or professional curiosity, I have kept up with the Linear Mills case and the filings through news clippings and the court filing itself, which I will link in the description of this video below. Reader beware, it is fucking grim reading. The details of this case make me physically sick if I think about it for too long. In case you're not familiar and you don't want to torture yourself with the full brief, I will attempt to give you the lightest possible account of the facts and allegations from the filing. An 18-year-old girl died whilst on a training dive in a lake in Montana in November 2020. She died with no inflator hose connected to her dry suit and with 44 pounds of non-dumpable lead zippered into her BCD and dry suit pockets. The case alleges she died with signs of suit squeeze and other forms of barotrauma resulting in her drowning. The girl was participating in her advanced open water course. Neither her instructor nor the dive center had completed a medical questionnaire for her, nor any kind of liability release, waiver, or assumption of risk. The victim was an open water diver who had five previously logged dives, all in warm water locations. She had never dived a dry suit before. She was not given a dry suit orientation by her instructor in confined water, as best practice would suggest. Her instructor was not a dry suit specialty instructor. The dive center, Gull Dive, who facilitated that training course, had been involved in another death four months earlier when they rented scuba equipment to an uncertified person who subsequently died on a dive. The dive instructor in question, Deborah Snow, was a newly certified paddy instructor who had failed her first attempt at a paddy instructor exam before being allowed to retake the exam two months later, passing at the second time of asking. Both Deborah's instructor exams were taken in Key Largo at Rainbow Reef Dive Center, a very different environment to Missoula, Montana. In the weeks and months immediately following Linnea's death, Paddy continued issuing certifications in Deborah Snow's name, even to divers who were on that tragic dive and who, due to the incident, of course did not meet the skills performance for the various courses that they were on that day. Now, I don't want to talk about how the dive instructor made a 14-year-old diver assist with the body recovery, and I don't want to talk about how the dry suit was purchased, used in a private sale, and sold without an inflate hose, which is the equivalent of selling a pre-owned car without the brakes. What I want to talk about instead are my three hopes that something positive can come out of this absolutely heartbreaking incident. I got really mad that criminal charges were not being pursued. If this isn't gross negligence or manslaughter, I don't know what is. I don't understand what the federal prosecutors meant when they said they didn't have enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me say this again slowly. An 18-year-old girl in a dry suit with no inflator hose, with 44 pounds of non-dumpable weight and no prior dry suit experience under instruction. 
This is what gross negligence looks like in the dive industry. It doesn't get more clear than that. It should have been a slam dunk. And I really wanted to see the dive instructor and the dive center owners serve hard time as an example to the industry. I wanted them to be hung out and dry. But alas, the federal prosecutors lacked a set of cojones. And yes, federal because the incident took place in a national park, ergo federal land. <sighs> Sorry, I get really, really angry about this. Really angry. <sighs> Breathe. So together, hopefully we can dispel some of my anger and here are the changes I hope this case brings forth. First and foremost, I hope that Paddy gets hurt. Paddy are made of Teflon, so it seems. Nothing sticks to them. When the defecation hits the aerator, they cut all ties, deny all knowledge. It wasn't me, it was Patricia. It always makes me laugh when I get Facebook friend requests from strangers and I check their profile to see how we're connected and it says, works at Paddy Dive Instructor. No, you don't. You don't work at Paddy at all. Trust me, if you kill a student, Paddy will not go to bat for you. They won't. They will wash their hands of you and claim you are no agent of theirs. They will still cash your membership fee check though. So you are a Paddy member, but also you're not a Paddy member and we have nothing to do with you and you are not an agent of ours and you are acting of your own accord. If you worked for Paddy, you wouldn't need your own liability insurance because you'd be covered by theirs. So whilst it's too much to probably hope for that the $12 million suit, one of the largest in scuba diving history, is enough to bring Paddy to its knees, and heaven knows they've been training divers on their knees for long enough, I hope it's enough to make Paddy members wake up and realize that the Paddy Kool-Aid doesn't taste so sweet after all, and maybe the Paddy Dive Pros will distance themselves from that toxic brand. I wouldn't want to teach for a training agency that would gladly have Deborah Snow as one of their instructors, as one of my peers. What would that say about me? So I hope the good Paddy instructors, and they do exist, leave Paddy at their earliest possibility. It's also been exposed now that Paddy's QA program, that's Quality Assurance, uh, has finally been outed as the joke we all knew it was. We now have proof that it is completely fake and completely untrustworthy. We have a Paddy dive instructor who is still able to issue certifications while being investigated for killing a student. Where were you, QA? My hope is that the general diving public now understands that the Paddy brand is no assurance of quality instruction whatsoever. You pays your money, you takes your chances. So hopefully the prestige that some people feel by adding Paddy to their job title description will be tarnished. You are not a Paddy dive instructor, you never were. You are a dive instructor, you happen to teach Paddy programs, but that can, and in my opinion should, change. My next hope is that I hope that instructor courses get harder. And yes, this is a tired trope, a worn out cliche. The middle-aged white guy bitching about how many new instructors are pumped out every month. Zero to hero, pa. <sighs> but let me talk from my personal experience because I've only ever been involved in one Paddy Dive Instructor Development course, the one I took to become an instructor. And unlike Deborah Snow, I had a world-class course director as my instructor trainer at a top class facility. But still, the course was ridiculously easy. I'm pretty sure, knowing what I know now, that I could train a chimpanzee to pass a Paddy Instructor exam. 90% of my class got a 100% score on both written exams. Everybody passed. It was a slam dunk. It was. It felt guaranteed going into the whole thing. Paddy are very clever at advertising it as the ultimate challenge in scuba diving, but it really is not. And then you get someone like Deborah Snow who failed the IE. She failed her IE in November 2019, went back home for December, came back and retook an IE in January 2020 and was allowed to pass. How much diving did she do between November and January in Montana? I don't know, maybe a lot, maybe not very much. How much more study did she do over the Christmas and year period? My point being, how much better could she have gotten from November to two months later? So through the Key Largo grapevine, of course, 
you know, you hear things. And I understand that her dive skills and knowledge were substandard. So why was she allowed to be an instructor at all? I think you should have one shot at your IE, your instructor exam, no redos. If you don't pass the first time of asking, maybe teaching scuba isn't for you. It may be your dream to be a dive instructor, but maybe it shouldn't be your reality. Maybe go back to cutting hair, Deborah. How about that? Or if that is too extreme a tack for some of you guys to follow me down that rabbit hole, how about a mandatory no retake time, like one year? You fail your IE, sorry, you can't retake it again for one year. That way it gives people time to assess, number one, whether the scuba diving career is really the, the one they want to do. And if it truly is, it gives that individual time to increase their skills and knowledge to the required standard. Two months is nothing. It makes no sense at all. The next thing that's got to go is this whole zero to hero mentality. You can't have never dived before and be an instructor for diving two months later. It makes no sense. The minimum number of dives to become an instructor for scuba needs to be the same as it is to become an instructor for skydiving. 500 dives. How can that be a bad thing? Give me a reason why not. I'll wait. My third hope is that I hope self-certifying as a specialty instructor becomes extinct. And I see this all the time. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. I've mentioned it in other videos, but let's say I'm a paddy dive instructor and you come to me and want to pay me cold, hard cash to teach you a wreck diver course. Only one problem, I don't happen to be a paddy wreck diver specialty instructor. Well, no worries. I can download a form from their website, check a couple of boxes saying that I have certified 25 divers on other courses and that I myself have completed 20 rec dives, never see an instructor trainer, never have any kind of vetting or validation from Paddy, and hey presto, automatically I'm a rec specialty instructor. Now, I've done 20 rec dives, okay check box, maybe I've only done 18, maybe I've only done 15. I may have had no formal rec training myself, I may not even be a rec specialty diver. I may have never laid line on a rec before or handled a reel, but now all of a sudden I'm qualified to teach those skills? Does that make any kind of sense to anyone? Please, comment section down below. I always try and explain to all my students at all levels that if you come to train with me, I'm here in South Florida. We will dive in the ocean, in the salt, there will be current, there will be waves, but it will be tropical on the surface and warm in the water, even if you come in winter. If you then decide to go home from South Florida to Canada or Michigan and dive in fresh, cold lake water, you would be best served by getting additional training on top of what I've taught you from a local instructor who is familiar with those conditions. Deborah Snow was not a dry suit instructor. She trained in Florida. She had no business in dry suit weather. The dive shop, Gold Dive, should never have hired her because she wasn't qualified to teach in Montana, in my opinion. Being a dive instructor should not be in any weather, any conditions to pass to teach wherever you like. You shouldn't do your IE in Utella, Honduras, and then go work on an expedition ship in Norway. It doesn't make sense. Those are totally unrelated training environments. So to recap then, I hope that Linear Mill's legacy is that Paddy is forced to make serious changes to its lackadaisical instructor training program. I hope the course gets tougher, and I hope the IE pass fail requirements become a lot more stringent. I hope that good dive instructors choose to distance themselves from the Paddy brand until improvements are made to their products, and that we develop some kind of culture in this sport where we decide that instructors should only teach courses in the conditions in which they are completely comfortable. The first tragedy has already happened. Linear Mills has died. The second tragedy will be if nothing changes. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry I got a little bit upset there. Thank you so much for watching. My apologies for the morbid nature of this video, but like I said, I'm trying to find some light in this story and it is a dark, nasty well that makes me professionally embarrassed of my entire community, unfortunately. But many of you had emailed me and you'd asked me for my take on this and you know, I, we have a great relationship with the people that watch these videos. So, I didn't want to linger too long. I had to get these feelings off my chest and I really appreciate you spending your time with me. Next week, we will be back with our usual content where I will be reviewing the Garmin Descent G1 Solar. So we'll be back to something a little bit more light 
And uh, yeah, on track. Okay, I'm gonna go and have a lie down in a dark room now. Ladies and gentlemen, subscribe if you haven't done so already, and I'll see you in the next video. Dive safe, dive often.